then we also have startup ivos one is to have a startup demonstrate its product and go to specific investors and many startups also feel that having certain uh, individual investor arrangements at times limits their freedom of action freedom of thought they are not able to think and act because they have the investors on their board and the investor expectations are at times are quite different a startup may have a time horizon of 5 to 7 years whereas an investor may have a time horizon of 3 to 5 years in which case how do you really manage the valuation game and how would you provide the returns to the investor in which case there would be undue pressure therefore ipo initial public offer where the company directly goes to the marketplace and seek public holding is uh, an extremely viable and uh, appropriate way of doing we also we already saw how thyrocare has uh, gone into the public and uh, become a quite a valued company there have been many other uh, companies which were startups and became uh, successful public uh, companies just dial 2013 infibeam in 2016 quick hill 2016 yatra 2016 again tejas networks in 2017 and matrimony.com in 2017 these have been successful companies which made ip was uh, so that they could get the kind of funding they require for the growth of the firms and they become more diversified in their equity system but all said and done ipos are not very common in the indian startup scene given that funding ra- comes rather easily for good and proven ideas now the regulators in india have been thinking how to support uh, startups public listing on stock exchanges certainly provides certain advantages one it builds brand image with all the stakeholders including investors customers employees public and governments then provides measurable value to company's performance potential because once you are listed on the public stock exchanges you got certain corporate governance methodologies which you need to adopt and it adds transparency and value to the employee stock option schemes because although the startups provide lot of uh, employee stock option schemes they can only be cashed when the valuation happens or when the exits happen or at predetermined buyback situation but on the other hand if a company is listed publicly the company would be in a position to provide value to the stock options more readily then a public offering always reduces the dependence on debt by bringing in more risk capital however to be listed successfully a startup requires very good corporate governance and regulatory compliance it requires high level of transparency and a strong leadership with a qualified board of directors this requires uh, at least uh, 6 to 12 months of preparation before a private startup can aim to become a successful uh, publicly held uh, startup but it pays for startup to integrate some of these uh, features early on from the very beginning so that the transition from the private enterprise closely held private enterprise to public enterprise is smooth and seamless and overall the advantages of public listing will far outweigh the disadvantage if any even the best technology companies of uh, us such as microsoft apple google facebook twitter have all prospered with public listing but at the same time we also have seen very recent times that uh, public listing has its risks if a company is not well managed or if this uh, whole business model is based more on a bubbly valuation than on uh, actual execution we have seen that example also in recent times therefore it is important that ipos must be considered as one of the very viable ways of uh, providing uh, startup financing so we have seen the first steps we have a platform called emerge platform it is an integrated institutional trading platform for startups and small and medium enterprises which do not have their securities listed on any recognized stock exchange and which seek listing of their specified securities exclusively on the said platform for informed investors it is a credible platform because it is supported by national stock exchange and it can be done with or without ipo given that we have 20000 startups as we have seen i i would think that there is significant potential to help this uh, itp platform gain more currency for the startups to accept as uh, we have many angel and venture capital uh, people wanting to support uh, startups having this platform enables them to look at these uh, ventures in a more cohesive and more uh, 
time bound manner and also it helps the investors move out after the investments mature so it's a kind of uh, from a negotiated settlement stage you move to a publicly benchmarked uh, exit stage which is good for the startup supporters as well as for the investors then we have another way of funding the startups which is crowdfunding crowdfunding is not uh, legal in india as far as the startups or any other company is required but it is legal in certain countries there are uh, startup crowdfunding companies like uh, micro ventures we have got angelis circle up grow vc it brings the power of masses in full even to the smallest uh, startup venture and the advantage is that even launch can be done through crowdfunding of uh, startups and in a way it is democratization of startup movement it helps startups move from relation based a focus based working to get finances to a democratized way of uh, getting finances from a wide spectrum of people they also help in uh, marketing of the products which are developed by the startups so as we have seen in india as well as elsewhere startups could succeed with investments ranging from a few thousands of rupees to a few lakh of rupees so crowdfunding is an ideal uh, situation for meeting small startups requirements for small scales of funds whereas many times startups say when they knock at the doors people will say that this is not my ticket size this is not my ticket size why don't you develop your product with your own savings and come to me after a particular ticket size of uh, fundraising is required but when you look at crowdfunding none of such restrictions will matter it is quite possible that uh, even a small uh, fundraising can be achieved and you can therefore have successive rounds of crowdfunding and uh, titrate yourself to your uh, growth phase in us we have got the jobs act which provides crowdfunding up to us dollar 1 million which can be raised by startups i would suggest that we should look at something similar in nature for india as well as and with lot of uh, uh, industry executives uh, retired personnel wanting to participate in the startup systems but with a defined uh, platform this could be another way to increase funding support to startups then how do you do ideas as bankable propositions so when we have scientists when we have got professors when we have got uh, technicians who have brilliant ideas but which are not related to their uh, nature of business and which cannot be supported these ideas remain as ideas however when they decide along with their companies that i should be able to convert these ideas into action this is a kind of idea banking ideas themselves will be the currency which can be used for starting uh, new startups in the western university system we have got university professors using their ideas their laboratory products their laboratory ideas into successful startups sharing the revenues with the universities it is quite possible for us also to replicate this methodology by which graduates of premier institutions as well as professors of leading institutes are uh, sharing their ideas with the startup ecosystem or themselves setting up uh, their own startup so that the ideas are not left in cold freeze they are banked to startup uh, success this requires that corporations also participate in this they can support these kinds of ventures by academicians and uh, creative students they can also help the executives within their own companies move into this space for example in today's automobile movement towards electric vehicles it is quite uh, possible for a battery maker to energize their own stuff to set up uh, their idea banks and select those ideas which can be moved into the startup stage so internal startup idea bank generation and then conversion of those ideas into successful startups is quite possible with corporate support so universities professors creative students progressive corporations they can always uh, and at all times uh, make ideas as a pool of currency for generating new startups so we have considered uh, so far several ways of uh, doing uh, startup investments but basically there are three types of uh, instruments by which this finance comes one comes through equity second comes through convertible debt and third comes through 
venture debt. When a founder believes that the project has proved itself, the founder may issue direct equity because at that point of time the valuation can be high and the dilution the founder experience is low. But on the other hand, if the founders believe that uh, the or the investors also believe that the project is yet to be proved, you can look at a convertible debt which is fully convertible, partially convertible or non-convertible so that the risk profile of the project is acceptable to the founders as well as for the investors. And in some cases we can as add venture debt which is having a coupon rate. So this is the same as that. Venture debt is a senior secured loan that sits on top of the funding file and in terms of the liquidation preference it has to be repaid before all other debt or equity holders. It is usually issued by aggressive banks and venture debt investors. So the three investment instruments which we have discussed so far which is the equity, the debt and the venture debt differ in terms of their criteria when they could be applied. But at the core of all these things is a business plan. The business plan determines what kind of equity instrument could be put. So if you let us say have a convertible uh, debt instrument, the conversion will take place when the business plan is uh, actually achieved in practice. So business plan becomes very important. On the other hand, if somebody is putting in equity on the basis that there would be high revenue growth and therefore high valuation, again business plan becomes extremely important. So the rights of the investors, the protection as well as the risk that is taken depends on the business plan. So the link below gives you an extremely good uh, summary of the financial instruments that are available in terms of equity, debt and uh, convertibles for startup financing. We also have talked about uh, financial sufficiency. How does financial sufficiency come? Financial sufficiency comes not only from uh, whatever uh, support we are having through direct finance and direct investment, but it also comes through marketplace support. We have discussed marketplace support through bootstrapping. That is very specific to a particular startup at a particular phase of time. But we must have a regular uh, support systems. So when government says that uh, uh, e-procurement should look at startups in a preferential manner, or if you say that startups should not be allowed to have uh, uh, receivables in waiting, or when we say that a government marketplace is created for online procurement uh, for various government uh, departments and ministries and MSMEs have a special channel in that uh, area, then we have got an ecosystem which is uh, available at all times to support startups and more such uh, initiatives not only by the government and the public sector but also by the private sector would help have financial sub sufficiency for the startups. Similarly, a fund of funds created by the government of India so to support uh, the startups that is also helpful and a private fund of funds with uh, participation by the mutual funds, pension funds, provident fund organizations, corporate groups that also helps the startups have financial sufficiency. The third way to do is to ensure that we have uh, more of smaller banks all across the nation support the startup activity. The problem with the commercial banking in startup situation is that there are certain rules and procedures. Banks are custodians of public deposits. Many people provide their lifetime savings in the banks on the basis that they will be paid whenever they are required, whether as savings bank accounts or fixed deposit account. Therefore, when they lend that money for other activities, banks have got certain responsibilities and regulations. So, when banks do these activities, they have got certain uh, requirements, there are certain limits to which they can extend the loans, they have expectations of margins to be provided by the loan seeker, they have got certain collaterals that have to be pledged to the bank and the interest rates naturally will be high because they have to have a spread between the deposit rate and the interest rate. Therefore, banks have become the funding agents of choice when the business model is established and there is a viable operating cycle which they can fund and also in which they can participate as working capital lenders. But as we have seen technology driven startups 
work under completely different platforms where ideas have to be worked on for months and years before the first revenue happens and even the first revenue may not be profitable until a particular level of scale is uh, achieved. So the banking system, the way it is uh, designed and which is in which it, it has to prudentially operate does not lend itself readily to supporting startup funding. Given this limitation, the government has been seeing what can I do? So a Stand Up India ecosystem has been developed, which is basically a methodology for uh, social entrepreneurship. It has been developed for empowerment of underprivileged through entrepreneurship. And it has got uh, linkage between banks and the uh, indigent entrepreneurs. And it provides bank loans between 10 lakhs and 1 crore rupees for at least one uh, in scheduled caste or scheduled tribe borrower and at least one woman borrower per bank branch for setting up a greenfield enterprise. And the enterprise can be in manufacturing, service or the trading sector. And in non-individual enterprises, 51% of the designated type of person should be a participant in the scheme. Apart from the commercial banks, a new age fintech companies are also coming in where they take money from banks but they are able to deploy them in more efficient way for uh, kickstarting the startup system. So we have got Capital Float, Neo Growth, Kinara Capital, Lending Cart, Indifi, which are into this new age financial uh, empowerment for uh, individuals as well as for startups. Then the big way is the large finance corporations support, microfinance corporation support for startups. They are extending, normally urban systems are supported by the large banking corporations and rural systems are supported by microfinance corporations and microfinance corporations have been very instrumental in helping self-help groups. But many microfinance corporations have also converted themselves into small finance banks and the moment they became small finance banks, they started operating as uh, larger financial banks and the rules and regulations which pertain to banking system become applicable. Therefore, their ability to support self-employment or entrepreneurship becomes limited. So microfinance corporations still have got a significant uh, role to play in uh, motivating startup movement and given that NBFC system today is in a kind of uh, liquidity crunch, we got to wait and watch for the improvement and recovery in the NBFC system to support uh, greater startup support. But their stellar role cannot be denied and uh, one has to really expect future uh, support from that. Grameen Bank has been uh, a great example and in India itself we have got uh, many uh, banks, Pandana Spurti and uh, Ujjivan, they have all been uh, very successful in uh, helping uh, companies uh, succeed in the startup route through their uh, support. So given this kind of NBFC requirement, government has formulated uh, Mudra, which is uh, Pradhan Mantri Mudra Yojana to support uh, startup activities. We have got uh, loans of different types up to 50,000, 50,000 to 5 lakh, 5 lakh to 10 lakh with different uh, roles and regions and the number of loans so far is uh, a staggering 6 million loans san uh, sanctioned in 2018-19 which is a very impressive and very recently loan within one hour kind of uh, format has also been sanctioned. But in all these things the startups also have to remember that the success of all these ventures which are very progressively and positively thought of is linked to the recovery being possible which means that the operating models have to be proper and successful and they have to provide the funds back to the lending institutions. So the public sector banks have been trying given and also the private large corporate banks have been trying various methodologies to participate and support the startup system despite the limitations they have in terms of the normal banking lending regulations. So Axis Bank has thought about an initiative which is called Thought Factory with, which starts with the ideation stage and works with the startups is a two-way benefit and the focus is on items which are required for the bank. Similarly, Federal Bank has Launchpad, HDFC Bank has got Smartup, ICIC Bank has got iStartup Garage, Kotak Mahindra Bank has got Kotak Business Boosters, 
Atnakar Bank has got Startup Club and State Bank of India has got IT ISEP. So these are all the areas in which the banks are collaborating with the startups, providing a healthy platform of not only idea, exchange of ideas but also ways and means in which they can participate with uh, innovations that are useful for the fintech in general and also for uh, newer areas like uh, artificial intelligence and analytics, biometrics, etc. So we have considered various aspects of uh, financing and the canvas is uh, very vast and it is indeed very difficult to trace them in a very sequential manner. So what we have seen in a way is a potpourri of various uh, financing options and uh, it is a kind of uh, pick and choose depending upon the startup. But to be able to access any finance, an organized structure is required for the startup. And how does a startup organize itself legally as an entity? So there are again uh, six options available. First option is sole proprietorship is not obviously a great option for uh, starting a growth oriented startup. It is very good for a nano enterprise and it helps uh, keep the liabilities uh, personal and it is uh, ideal for family and self employment opportunity. Then comes partnership like uh, two people join together and this is probably this minimum required for starting registration with the registrar of companies. Again it is not amenable to investors because by law it is limited to two people starting the business and it could have more people but not really uh, suited for investors of the kind which we have discussed. Then comes limited liability partnership very ideal for uh, professionals to join hands together has limited liability but it again is not limited for investments by other people investors. So if you are in the startup game and you want to scale yourself up it is very important to look at forms of company formation which can take investor interest inside which is private limited company, a one person company or a public limited company. And in this private limited company is the mode of choice to start the startup activity and then uh, enable venture capital firms or uh, private equity firms to participate in this and then move on to become a public limited company. The pros and cons of uh, different types of company formation are uh, listed in this slide. But then uh, there is also this uh, question, is valuation a lever of financing or is a risk of financing? Is the chase for valuations a race to the bottom? An enigmatic feature of the tech based startup system as opposed to a physical operating model of a company is that if a startup is able to achieve a large user base and high market share even without any clear path to the profit investors are willing to provide huge sums of their money to the startups. So in uh, West there has been abundant availability of funding for such companies and in 2005 VC funding was just to 20 million dollars in the US and in 2018 it touched nearly 100 billion dollars. However, studies say that this has not necessarily been accompanied by either the rise of unicorns which are uh, profitable or it has been accompanied by overall financial health and viability of the startup. So the rise in financing has had no correlation with the rise in profitability of startup. And how does this high share get achieved? High share gets achieved with the lower prices or higher discounts. So we have a revenue, you have a profit and you have a valuation parameter. So in India as well we have got examples where uh, companies have been having high turnovers but the losses also have been very high. So it is no longer it is the kind of profitability percentage which is determining investment enthusiasm. It is the market uh, share and market uh, presence uh, which is driving this. There have been exceptions like uh, TransferWise which have been prudently managed but overall many companies which are very well fancy in terms in startup space have had uh, uh, still unviable operations. So these are margin destroying measures in one way, discounts, incentives, low prices, offers and once these are uh, withdrawn for whatever reason then the growth tends to falter. So there is a paper written in Medium that uh, most such unicorns are overvalued on paper for a variety of reasons including protection for VCs which makes them vulnerable to tech bubbles that could burst in periods of recession. So when India as a country 
is not really resource rich to be able to be profligate or extravagant in these kinds of investments. We need to really look at operating models which ensure not only revenue growth but also profit growth. So the more the startups pursue business models that have prudent balance of revenues and profits, the better will be our startup ecosystem and better will be our uh, ability to attract funds indigenously as well as exogenously. So there are obviously pros and cons of uh, pursuing growth versus pursuing uh, profit. So this graphic tells us what are the upsides of maximizing growth, what are the downsides of maximizing growth. Similarly, what are the upsides of maximizing profit versus the downsides of maximizing. So when you maximize the growth, you become more attractive to the investors. We, we raise capital when it is available and uh, it does have benefits of monopoly. On the downside, if such growth is dependent on uh, uh, just uh, discounts, then we become vulnerable. Similarly, the dependence on equity that comes with high growth, therefore high equity led uh, growth means that the startup is vulnerable for external dependence and it has got its own uh, short term implications. The advantage of maximizing profit, the startup becomes very attractive for acquisition particularly by mainstream firms. Profitable firms have better IPOs and founders can retain more uh, equity. On the other hand, if we are so obsessed with profit, then we may end up being only niche player. We will not be able to uh, grow and attract capital in a VC system which is unfortunately or fortunately growth obsessed. And if profits are achieved through cost cutting, probably that may not also be the best way to the grow a business. Therefore, we require a balanced business strategy and a balanced business model that optimizes the growth profit equation based on the startup context. That is also very important. So finally, we need to look at uh, financing as part of overall business strategy. We should look at scalability, we should return, we should look at sustainability. So we should pursue scale when we are the first entrant, when the entry barriers are low, when the need is to preempt competition and when the VC system is growth driven. So if anybody can enter the market, it is important that we capture the marketplace very quickly. So therefore, growth is important. Therefore, it makes sense if you are low price, low margin uh, player, but have a high market share. But on the other hand, if your scale is price driven, you should start pursuing profit. When cost efficiencies are possible, you should pursue profit. When we need independence to pursue your own thoughts and your own product ideas, you need to look at pursue. And when the VC system is discerning and differentiated to understand what is a discount-led growth versus what is profit-led growth, you should pursue profit. And obviously, you should pursue a combination of both when you have got certain core competencies which are solid, like your product is IP protected, your entry barriers are muted, when you are desirous of long-term play, and when your VC system is cautious, then we should uh, look at uh, scalability along with sustainability. So these are the two sides of virtual uh, growth paradigm. Ideally, innovation needs to be funded by business growth valuations because if your innovation is of that kind of disruptive innovation, eventually business will be valued highly. Therefore, it should be funded by equity risk capital. Whereas once that innovation is brought into a product stage, that operational growth needs to be funded by more short term non-equity capital which will be like non-convertible debt or convertible debt with a mix of equity conversion as well as uh, coupon rate and also linked to the clear metrics of performance. Then we will talk about uh, pitch deck for a few minutes because startup may have certain value propositions, startup founders may have a lot of passion but how do we really engage as startup founders with the investors? be it the bank or be it the venture capital investor or the angel investor. For that pitch deck is important. A pitch deck is a vital vehicle for startup founders to engage with all stakeholders, more specifically the investor community. Given that there are many more startups than the funding streams available and typically a good VC has at least 10 meetings a day I believe and you have to capture the interest of the investor in a short period of time and to be able to do that you should have a pitch deck which has certain ingredients. A pitch deck is a vital vehicle for startup founders to engage with all stakeholders because whatever the idea, whatever the passion the entrepreneur has 
has to be conveyed to the investors in a very effective manner. And pitch deck is something very unique to the startup community because it is a combination of uh, concise presentation with the expansive thoughts the startup has got. It is a skill and it is an art as well. And that to be effectively translated into visible action, the pitch deck should have uh, these four components. The first is the problem statement. What is the problem that the startup has discovered and uh, the solution of which would be very helpful for the society at large or for the business community or the customer base which it is going to serve in future. The second is the solution that is proposed to solve the problem. How elegant it is, how effective it is going to be and how technologically elegant it is. The third one is the prototype build. In case the prototype has already been built, demonstration of the prototype and also the user feedback on the prototype. And the investor will also be keen to know the kind of business model that has been uh, adopted by the company, whether it is a uh, operations driven business model, customer driven business model, what kind of uh, price mechanisms are being adopted, what are the kinds of uh, business to business relationships or business to consumer relationships that are being thought about as the business model. Now, what is the intellectual property that is underpinning this entire uh, idea? And what is the team? And what is the execution model? A pitch deck must interest, engage and inspire the stakeholders into positive commitment with the founders. And they should stay engaged with the founders, number one. Number two, if the pitch deck is narrated by the founders with passion, there is a even greater chance of the engagement reaching higher levels and the value proposition becoming inspirational not only the, to the founders as it has always been but also to the investors. So pitch deck is an extremely important uh, constituent of the whole investment proposition. There are basically three types of pitch decks. One is the pre-meeting pitch deck, second is an in-meeting pitch deck and third is a post-meeting pitch deck. The pre-meeting pitch deck is typically a teaser document. It is short concise but effective, helps in generating interest in the investor and is also self-explanatory with no proprietary information. An in-meeting teaser is a sufficiently detailed document. It will have all the eight components which I have discussed in the previous uh, slide and it is always accompanied by in-person in narration. It contains all the critical information and leads to serious investment dialogue. And when the meeting concludes, there would obviously be certain questions and certain issues that are raised and certain propositions from both sides. Typically, in-meeting uh, pitch deck is followed upon by a post-meeting uh, pitch deck. It is a closure deck it, that addresses all the concerns, all the issues discussed, reaffirms the business strategy and the execution model, and it is very specific on the desired investment needs. So these three pitch decks are an integral part of the investment transaction that uh, is targeted and the startup should have the necessary skills and capability to create the pitch decks and also narrate them when it is required to be narrated. I would also conclude this uh, session saying that while finance is an extremely important aspect of startup journey and while finance is a constraint for the indigent uh, startup uh, founders. But finance also is not a constraint to become an entrepreneur. We have here eight examples and the source also has been provided here where people with very meager finances have set up startups and grown them to size of 400 crores or 650 crores with an ability to manage employee base of 1200 people or 1600 people and coming as they were with humble family backgrounds in certain cases without any educational background and in some cases certain uh, uh, specially challenged uh, physical situations and in diverse in industrial settings. One was successful in confectionery, one was successful in uh, moving goods from one location to other, another has been successful in making ready to eat foods, another has been successful in uh, uh, converting palm leaves into disposable items. One was a consultant, another was a milk, uh, dairy products manufacturer and one took a very native dish such as vada pav to a national level. 
So, it is possible for starting with low finance at times as low as 11,000 rupees and start a business and can make it grow to a big scale. But why does this happen? How does this happen? It happens because such startup founders of course had passion, they had diligence, they had the capability, but they also deployed self-financing business models with innovation and execution. So when you look at Asha Confectionery, the stunning point was when it moved from small business to automated production. When we look at Agarwal Packers and Movers, the core success factor was 100% safety guaranteed to the customers. So, significant customer orientation and choice of the team and choice of the vehicles for movement. When we look at ID Fresh Food, which is specialist in uh, batters for uh, South Indian dishes and also for uh, North Indian wheat based product, technology to make food ingredients without the preservatives, that has been a winning proposition. So, that has helped the company. When we look at Womomo, category creation in unique snacks. Volant Industries, despite the physical handicap, fearlessness in turning around sick paper units has been the core. Similarly, Singhi Advisors, personalized investment advice, personalized deal making, M&A support. Milky Mist, coming from a farmer's son background, using that core capability from sell, selling milk to creating milk products and distributing nationally. That has created a brand. Jumbo King Foods taking native Vada Pav to global scale with the appropriate automated production and delivery. So, business models despite the low finance have helped in generating sufficient finance for the startups to grow. So, it is a combination of innovation and execution that has enabled startups to grow. So, the principles of self-financing through successful business models are simple for established businesses as well as for uh, startups. One, market niche supported by product quality. Third, good distribution efficiency, appropriate client identification, very strong working capital efficiency, dedicated and well-trained employee team, personal leadership. So, if you look at these eight examples, these eight examples demonstrate that a good working professional business model helps you meet the funding gap by yourself. You can operate a business model that generates profits. So, while we pursue exotic and very required startup tech based models, we also must simultaneously see how we can have operational models which emphasize all of these features so that the business by itself can generate finance, reduce dependence on external funding provide more value in the hands of founders for longer period of time and then ensure that the startup ecosystem is much more uh, enterprising, much more viable and much more uh, self-supporting.